Um, hello, everybody. My name is Bryce Wakefield, and I am the National Executive Director of the Australian Institute of International Affairs. Um, welcome. Uh, we have a very special uh, session here today, but before we get started, I would like to acknowledge uh, that I'm sitting on Ngunnawal country, um, the Indigenous people, of course, of, um, of Canberra, and I'd like to pay my respects to their, el to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, I'd also like to pay my respects to First Australians, all First Australians, and um, any Indigenous people on lands where you may be seated if you're watching online. Um, I note that we have uh, quite a few New Zealanders in the audience, both in the live audience and um, online. Uh, we have a number of excellencies uh, and other diplomatic staff and staff from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in, uh, uh, from Australia. Um, we're also very grateful for the presence of um, Damonette King, who is the High Commissioner to New Zealand. Um, uh, and um, as we do have a number of New Zealanders, including our very special guests, I'd like to wish you all um, a well, no mai, haere mai, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou koutou. Um, and our very special guest today is, of course, uh, the former Prime Minister of New Zealand, Helen Clark. Um, she was the Prime Minister for three successive terms from 1999 to 2008. She was a Member of Parliament in New Zealand for over 27 years. And prior to being elected to Parliament in 1981, she taught political studies at the Department of uh, and she's taught at the Political Studies Department at the University of Auckland, uh, my old school. And in April 2009, uh, she became the administrator of the United Nations Development Program. She was the first woman to lead the organization and served two terms there. At the same time, she was also the chair of the United Nations Development Group, which is a committee that oversaw uh, all UN funds, programs, agencies, and departments working on development issues. In July 2020, she was appointed by the Director General of, World, of the World Health Organization as a co-chair of the Independent Panel for Pandemic Preparedness and Response, uh, called for by the World Health Assembly, and that body will report, or has reported in May um, this year. And the uh, title, of course, of uh, today's or the topic of today's event is um, is uh, learning from COVID. What the, the the findings of that panel will teach us. And she will be in discussion today with, or after her talk, she will have a discussion with Ellen Gingell, who is the uh, president of the Australian Institute of International Affairs. Um, he's been the president since 2017, but earlier uh, in 2010, he was appointed a fellow of this institute. Um, he's an honorary professor with the Australian National University's College of Asia and the Pacific, and was most recently uh, director of the ANU Crawford Leadership Forum. Um, he was the Director General of the Australian Office of National Assessments from 2009 to 2013. Um, and prior to that, he was the, ex uh, the founding executive director of the Lowy Institute uh, from 2003 to 2009. He's worked in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. And he's also served overseas uh, in Rangoon, Singapore and Washington. He was a senior advisor to Paul Keating. So uh, with, I'd also like to mention um, uh, one, one common genealogy, I guess, that, uh, that Helen Clark and uh, we here at the Australian Institute of International Affairs, Affairs have. Um, Helen Clark was just appointed this month, I think, president of Chatham House, a president of Chatham House. Uh, for those of you who know our institute, um, of course, um, our institute was founded in 1924 as a branch of Chatham House. Uh, so we have something in common here. Uh, welcome, um, welcome home, I guess, Helen. And uh, I'll now turn things over to Ellen. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, Bryce. And uh, welcome to everyone online and uh, and here in the room on a really horrible 
Canberra winter's uh, night. Uh, no, no event in my lifetime has had such a profound effect on the world as the appearance of the SARS-CoV-2 virus in late uh, 2019. I think you have to go back to the experience of global war to find something that matches its totalizing effect. The implications for global health, for everyone's domestic and international economies, uh, for politics, for ways of living, for ways of working, uh, uh, for uh, international equity, uh, gender equity, gender relations, even thought patterns, the way we think about the world, I think has, have changed uh, as a result of uh, this and have been universal uh, in their application. Um, uh, borders have been slammed shut around the world here in, here in Australia as well. I have to say that in all my long years, now it never occurred to me that one state border could uh, could close against uh, it's another. It was just a, an entirely uh, new and unexpected uh, experience. At least four million people and probably more have died um, around the world and the long-term health consequences for those who have survived the disease are as yet unknown. <clears throat> Now, it's not as though we uh, uh, hadn't known that something like this might uh, happen. The danger of pandemic disease have been uh, highlighted in almost every national or international uh, threat assessment that I know of. But marshalling the resources and the political will to, uh, to do enough to prepare was always something that we thought we, sh we could uh, put off. But it did happen and our collective response with the exception perhaps of uh, vaccine development uh, was inadequate. So in, in May 2020, the World Health Assembly, which is the you know, governing body for the World Health Organization, called for an independent and comprehensive uh, evaluation of the lessons learned from the pandemic. The Director General of the WHO announced in July the um, uh, creation of a, uh, an independent panel for pande pandemic preparedness and response, uh, jointly to be chaired by the former president of Liberia, uh, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, and our guest today, the former New Zealand Prime Minister, uh, Helen Clark. The two of them in turn gathered 11 uh, uh, eminent world leaders from a whole variety of backgrounds uh, to join the panel and then they set to work and the panel did its job remarkably quickly as, um, as anyone who has read the report and I urge you all to do so, it's online, uh, COVID-19 make it the last pandemic. It was a really remarkable achievement setting out both the origins of the pandemic, including a really useful uh, chron chronology of, uh, of how it happened uh, and a series of recommendations on what the international community should do. Now, I don't know what you expect of international reports, but I have to confess that my expectations are usually uh, pretty limited. I anticipate uh, language which will have been uh, honed down uh, to the point of meaninglessness in some places and recommendations which reach the lowest common denominator, what's generally acceptable and not much more. Well, there's nothing like that here. Um, the language is pointed, direct and colourful. The arrival of the pandemic, the, uh, the uh, report authors state was the 21st century's Chernobyl uh, moment. Uh, it found weak links at every point in the chain of preparedness and response. Global political leadership was absent, it bluntly stated, and it laid out a series of recommendations covering everything from high level preparedness to international financing as uh, response. Uh, no one escapes its uh, attention uh, or its judgment. Uh, system level change, it says, is required to deal with uh, this. 
And finally, the panel uh, concluded, uh, you have been warned. So uh, I, I was uh, really uh, astonished, to be frank, when I, uh, when I started reading the, uh, the document. And it's a great uh, honour for us to have uh, Helen Clark, uh, one of the co-chairs with us today. It's also very, uh, very, uh, very uh, kind of you, Helen, if I may, um, because I know that the demands on you are unceasing and that there are plenty of other things that you could have been doing with a, uh, on a New Zealand uh, uh, evening than, uh, than spend it uh, talking to a group of people stretched out around Australia. But here at the AAA, we did want to ensure that the independent, independent panel's report remained on national and international agendas as a basis for even wider discussion that goes to, uh, to issues of, uh, of global justice as well as national health. Um, so please join me in welcoming Helen Clark. Thank you. <laughs> Well, I guess I should say uh, kia ora and g'day uh, from uh, New Zealand. And uh, sorry, the, the bubble's not open. Uh, otherwise, it would have been a, a quick trip across the, the Tasman to do this in, purpose, in person. But you're right. Uh, you know, this is an event like nothing we've experienced in our lifetimes. Uh, I spend quite a lot of time with my father, who's 99 years, four and a half months old, Nothing like it's occurred in his lifetime either, because we have to go back to 1918, uh, the flu uh, pandemic and the catastrophic uh, ending of, of World War I uh, to find you know, times as challenging as, as these. Uh, so yeah, that, without precedent. Um, you've given a, a great uh, summary of the um, sort of general uh, direction that the report uh, took. And you're right, it, it's not your usual kind of bland um, review. Uh, we had a, a pretty stroppy panel, I think I can use that word. Uh, we had uh, Ernesto Zedillo, the former president of Mexico. We had David Miliband. We had you know, just an amazing cast of independent-minded people who said, if we're going to do a, a decent job, we shouldn't pull punches. We didn't actually set out to cast blame. We said, let's tell the truth about what happened and learn from it. Because as we know, those who don't learn from the lessons of history are doomed to repeat them over and over and, and over. So we then decided on a report that would not be you know, 300 pages, pages long, but rather uh, a shorter, punchier report. But then backed up by a huge volume of background papers on everything from the, the background to the kind of international legal instruments that could be used in future, uh, looking at all the issues around intellectual property of vaccines, the social and economic impacts of the pandemic, a detailed chronology of what happened uh, and, and when, a detailed look at the, the WHO and, and its issues and challenges. So alongside the short, punchy and very readable report, uh, then these these amazing background papers. Uh, one very substantial one uh, on the uh, on the range of national responses. We studied a, a couple of dozen of those in depth to draw uh, lessons uh, from from what worked and 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 what didn't appear uh, to work. So really, uh, most of the last year for me, uh, uh, a lot of time has gone into. Uh, being a co-chair, driving a secretariat along, making sure we had well-organized meetings and briefings and consultations and getting to the point where we could present uh, to the World Health Assembly uh, in, in May. And you're right, uh, this report comes out of last year's World Health Assembly. I'm inclined to think that when they called for the independent, impartial, and comprehensive review of the experiences of the internationally coordinated response to COVID-19, the full title, they probably thought the pandemic would have been over. And we were then, of course, <laughs> faced with presenting a report where the, the pandemic was still very much raging. And that, that's also had an influence on the nature of the recommendations, which I'll come to uh, a little bit longer later. But uh, when Dr. Tedros came to me, I mean, what can you say? Someone, someone has to do it. It's a hospital pass. But uh, 
you know, it, it's an important piece of work. And I think uh, our panel has really been quite pleased at the, the positive interest in, in what we've said. Now, there are, are other reports floating around. There's the G20 high level uh, panel one. There's another one commissioned by the uh, European region of the World Health Organization, headed by former Prime Minister Mario Monti of Italy. Uh, and we are working across the three panels now to see what convergence we might get from recommendations. Because if, if three reports are put in, in government's hands, that, that can be confusing. If we want a you know, good outcome out of this experience, we need to try and find where we can converge. And, and on many things, we're not that, that far apart. I should say that uh, at 5 a.m. today, Australian time, President Sirleaf and I briefed the UN General Assembly. And as I speak today, you'll, you'll uh, see why we went to the General Assembly. Our panel is adamant that the issues involved are far broader than health. We think a lot was loaded onto the World Health Organization when actually, just as at national government level, you need a multi-sectoral response to pandemic preparedness and, and response. So you do it at international level. And it's not just about what's reformed at the WHO and so on. It's actually about how you get that oversight, that coordination that grow, goes across sectors. And that has to happen at the global level. Uh, as well as at, at the national level. So this is bigger than WHO and the World Health Assembly, in our opinion. It does require the attention of the General Assembly. And, and I must say, I was very impressed at the seriousness with which the member states uh, greeted the, the briefing, well prepared and considered statements followed it. So you know, we continue to follow through to see what uh, action might uh, come from all of this. Let me also say for the record that the Australian government has been very positive about our work uh, from the beginning. Uh, I was able to uh, brief Foreign Minister Maurice Payne uh, just before, not long before our report came out and, and Australia's taken a very positive and, and helpful interest um, in it. Now, uh, just, uh, I mean, the background, uh, you're all so so well aware of the pandemic because we, we all follow it obsessively as nothing's more important to us than our, our, our health and factors that might uh, impact uh, on it. Uh, it has you know, really been a, a pandemic of, of, of inequalities, uh, whether they be health inequities, uh, socioeconomic inequities, um, rich poor country uh, inequities, where resources are least, uh, people uh, suffer most. But of course, the impact of the pandemic continues uh, everywhere. Uh, in some places, clearly, vaccines are blunting the worst of the impact. But for so many countries, supplies of vaccines are still very limited, and the prospects for uh, accessing them are being pushed you know, quite far out into the future. So you know, some countries are really beginning to despair. You gave the, the figures of what is reported to WHO and the number of cases and deaths, clearly a vast underestimate. Um, and I think it's only in retrospect when there are detailed looks at, at what are the excess mortality rates that we'll get some idea of the full impact of, of the disease. But yes, uh, our panel believes the disaster could have been averted if countries of the world had heeded the many warnings of the strong possibility of a virus with pandemic uh, potential getting on the loose and had been uh, prepared. And then when the outbreak began, if we had moved together as, as one world uh, in our response and put in place all the measures that we should have, uh, we wouldn't be in the mess we are today. So yes, the panel concluded that uh, this went from being a localized outbreak to a pandemic because of a whole series of failures and gaps uh, in pandemic preparedness and response. And there had been a failure in many countries to learn from past experiences. Uh, I might say there are quite a lot of reviews of previous uh, health um, uh, uh, disasters that have been gathering dust in the basements of the UN agencies and of governments. Uh, 
Uh, ours is far from being the first review. We'd like to make these the last reviews, by the way, because we got it right. Uh, on past practice, um, there would be more disasters and more reviews, and that's really what needs to be avoided uh, now. So uh, we use the, the hashtag and make this the last pandemic. Uh, while we know that one cannot stop the emergence of pathogens with pandemic potential, you can certainly stop them causing pandemics. And for that, we need much stronger international and national systems for pandemic preparedness and response, systems which are always alert and poised and capacitated to act. The job can't be done by any single country or sector working alone. It can't even be done by a group of countries, uh, no matter how willing. We're only as strong as our weakest link, and we have to work uh, together. When we develop the detailed chronology of what had happened, uh, we, we are not, by the way, the origins of the virus uh, inquiry, thank goodness, that's another political minefield in, a, in another place. But we, we went back roughly to what was known uh, when the, the doctors in Wuhan recognized that there, were a cluster, there was a cluster of cases of pneumonia of unknown origin. And let's give them credit. They reported it um, internally. They got samples sent away for tests. And when the results came back, and they came back within you know, the seven, eight, nine day kind of period, uh, the Wuhan health system issued local alerts. Now that is what was picked up by WHO and the scanning uh, networks who are looking for uh, evidence of these kinds of events uh, around the world. That, that's around the, uh, the 30th, 31st of January. But what we find from there is that the systems by which WHO must operate to validate and respond were just too slow to respond to a fast moving respiratory pathogen. And to put it at its, at its simplest, we are not in the Middle Ages when a virus went on foot and by donkey. We are in the 21st century where we are a highly globally interconnected world. And if a virus like this is on the loose and everyone's able to go for Lunar New Year holidays, you're going to have issues. Um, our panel concluded that WHO was constrained, not helped by the international health regulations. It simply needs more powers to be on the spot immediately, uh, to be able to publish information it has without having to ask for permission from countries, for acting in a precautionary fashion when there's something like a respiratory pathogen is on, on, on the loose. Uh, and we also say that the uh, decisions uh, that the Emergency Committee uh, convened under the International Health Regulations issues should be based on transparent, clear and objective criteria. And it, it remains, of course, a, a mystery why on the 22nd, 23rd of January, when that committee was first convened, that it did not declare a public health emergency of international concern by then, given that a very senior Chinese physician who was always also appointed to our panel by us uh, had already said there was evidence of human to human transmission. So there's about eight days lost before Dr. Tedros um, was able to issue uh, that declaration with the support of the emergency committee. And in between, he made a, a, a trip to Beijing. I, I think uh, you know, we, we can sort of see, join the dots here. However, even though uh, not everything went perfectly in January, February was a disaster. February is a wasted month. Uh, when far too many, far too few countries recognised that this was a health emergency, which could directly affect them. And I wonder, thinking back, whether it's because the world at large has escaped a bullet with recent public health emergency of international concern declarations. Ebola didn't come for most of us. Uh, uh, SARS in 2003, I was prime minister then. I'm scratching my head to remember anything about it. You know, it was sort of out there and we, we kind of prepared, but it, it was a dog that, that didn't bark for us. Zika hasn't barked uh, particularly uh, loudly, a little in the South Pacific. But, you know, so we've dodged a bullet mostly. 
and uh, we're not really psyched up to to jump when WHO says jump, and that's what a public health emergency of international concern declaration uh, is about. Of course, by the time people did jump, it was uh, uh, after not only after we had seen the distressing scenes from China and then from Iran, uh, but then the, the full force of the pandemic in the north of north of Italy. I think that that really galvanised. Uh, public attention and, and the rest is is, is history. Uh, so the failure to be prepared, the failure in February to put in place the measures which could have uh, contained it uh, globally, uh, this has not only cost uh, millions of lives and of course many people with long haul uh, COVID uh, uh, impacts, but the uh, impact on the world economy by 2025 is forecast to be a loss of about $22 trillion which is, of course, huge. Um, the lack of adequate social protection in many countries has been a huge constraint on effective action. Uh, as I listen to the news from Fiji, it seems that a significant part of the reluctance to lock down firmly has been uh, how would people survive? You know, about 4 billion of our fellow and sister world citizens don't have access to even basic social protection. And so in economies where there's a lot of subsistence, if you don't trade or work, you don't, you don't eat. And this has proved, you know, of course, fatal uh, for the, the, the spread of the disease. It, it uh, is impossible to contain and everybody's more or less carrying on uh, as, as they did. And uh, one of the things to look at, and this is why I say again, the issues of pandemic preparedness are far broader than health issues. Uh, you have to have universal basic protection and basic universal health coverage in place if you're to, if you're to fight these uh, these pandemics. Um, let me uh, note, of course, uh, the disproportionate impact on women and girls. Uh, in about a third of countries that WHO surveyed, sexual and reproductive health uh, services were disrupted badly. That meant women couldn't access contraception, safe abortion, prenatal services, birthing services, and postnatal services. So we have more unwanted pregnancies, uh, mortality more from unsafe abortions, births that uh, couldn't uh, be uh, properly uh, managed, and, and, and so on. We have the 11 million girl children that UNESCO estimates will never return to school because of impoverishment of, of families. Uh, and of course, the sharp increases in reported domestic violence around the world. It's also true globally that women uh, have lost uh, jobs uh, more than men because of the nature of the services they tended to be more dominant in, in retail and, and hospitality. Uh, so uh, many, uh, many uh, bad impacts there. Coming to uh, the recommendations, uh, we made two sets. The first were uh, focused on the immediate uh, situation. Uh, and let me deal with that uh, first. Um, because we're appalled by the two tier response, which has developed a pandemic control, where high income countries uh, do have the means to vaccinate all their citizens. I know. In your country and mine, of course, you know, people say couldn't have been earlier, is it too late? We're all going to get our vaccine <laughs> and probably this year, and we're sitting you know, behind more or less uh, secure borders to the extent that they can be with, with Delta, which is another challenge. Uh, but uh, there are just so many low and low middle income countries who haven't been able to ex vaccinate very many people at all. And there are uh, any number of countries where uh, the frontline health workers who are treating COVID patients in the hospital are, are not protected them, themselves. So this is uh, distressing. What our panel did was add up the number of doses which uh, high income countries had, had ordered. Uh, that's over 4 billion. We add up the, uh, the population of the high income countries. That's 1.16 billion. We say there's 2 billion spare doses on order which need to be redistributed. We called for a billion of those to be put back into COVAX or back directly to uh, needy countries by the 1st of September and another billion by mid next year. This is feasible. 
It's not yet happening at that scale, but it is feasible. One thing we also called for was for WHO to set a pathway, a strategy for where we needed to be to end of the pandemic, because the world didn't have that from WHO. And Dr. Tedros, at the time of the G7, uh, responded uh, to that recommendation by saying, by mid next year when G7 meets, we need 70% of the global population vaccinated if we're to kill off this pandemic. And he said that means globally, every country needs at least 10% vaccinated by September and 40% by the end of the year. We're going to struggle to meet that. To meet that target he set for mid next year, we need 11 billion doses. Haven't got them yet either. And that comes to uh, the, the other problem, uh, which is that uh, the scale of manufacturing has simply not been adequate to the task. Now, that then led India and South Africa to champion at WHO uh, a TRIPS uh, waiver uh, for vaccines and therapeutics uh, associated with the, the pandemic, which I personally favour. I think it needs the same approach uh, as was taken to the antiretrovirals and at the height of the AIDS uh, pandemic. It's a, it's a special uh, circumstance. But the panel also acknowledges that while the TRIPS waiver is, is an important tool, it's not coming quickly because there is significant opposition to it. And in any case, even with the TRIPS waiver, unless you get companies prepared to transfer knowledge and technology you know, for the vaccines, it, it's, it's, not, it's not going to be simple. Uh, so we called for WTO and WHO to convene urgently the manufacturing countries and the major companies uh, to figure out a game plan for scaling up production. Now, there has just been quite a productive meeting on that, and we're starting to see more initiatives to get production rolled out, whether it's South Africa, Senegal, whatever. But this is desperately needed, more centres of vaccination, particularly when one considers we're not talking about a one-off uh, vaccination round here. We're probably talking boosters and, 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 and so on. So that it's very, very important uh, that the the manufacturing is, is scaled, scaled up. But let me then move from the immediate actions that we talked about to the larger uh, global architecture. Uh, we see, and I emphasize again, a pandemic not only as a health crisis, as we've seen with this one, it's a social crisis, economic crisis, political crisis, peace and security crisis. And that is what, why our panel recommended that the UN General Assembly uh, should negotiate a political declaration on a reform path of the global architecture. Uh, and that uh, we recommended a special session or high level event or SG's Global Summit, doesn't really matter, but there has to be a rallying round, a roadmap uh, for the global uh, architecture uh, reforms. Now, at the top, of that uh, global uh, system. Uh, we have recommended creating a global health threats council at the level of heads of state and government, uh, regionally uh, representative, and including private sector and civil society. Uh, we say it's not an operational body, but it is a high level Uber oversight body, uh, which would monitor progress uh, towards a clear benchmarks and targets set by WHO for pandemic preparedness, draw attention to gaps and hold actors accountable. These are all key functions that we found uh, missing in the international uh, system. Uh, we have uh, you know, strongly backed uh, WHO and its indispensable role, and it is and of course should remain uh, the lead agency for health in, in the system, but it needs help needs to be adequately resourced, empowered, and further, further strengthened. And uh, we certainly welcome that the World Health Assembly has established an open working group on these very issues now, taking into account the kind of recommendations we have made and others may well make. On the prospects for a new pandemic convention, we've backed the new convention. We say it should fill gaps in the existing legal system. It should clarify responsibilities between states and international actors. Uh, we recommend 
that it be adopted using the powers under Article 19 of the WHO Constitution and be complementary to the international health regulation. Now, we did recommend this be done within six months, and some have said, isn't this too ambitious? I invoke the Chernobyl moment. Within five months of Chernobyl, the international community had negotiated two new international conventions, given the IAERA more powers, and all of this led to more collaboration and information sharing between member states on nuclear safety than ever before. Why is this not a Chernobyl moment in global health? Unfortunately, the World Health Assembly did not start a process of negotiation on a convention. It's going to talk about it in November. And this is uh, really quite, uh, quite concerning. But anyway, uh, November is closer now than it was when we made our report. So we, we hope, for, uh, hope for the best. On financing, we think this needs dedicated uh, financing uh, by formula. We think uh, that pandemic preparedness and response are global public goods and should be funded accordingly. Uh, by um, an ability to pay mechanism of the kind that member states are familiar with, with say their UN membership dues or their WHO dues or whatever. We say that to uh, support the low and middle income, uh, low and low middle income countries, which most need support with preparedness, you're looking at around 10 billion a year, which is not a lot to finance, but the facility has to have the capacity to leverage up to 100 billion for rapid disbursement over that first 100 days of critical response to the pandemic threat uh, materializes. We don't call for a new global fund. We call it a facility, which uh, should probably be hosted by one of the existing uh, IFIs. Um, we've also uh, had things to say about how to transform the access to COVID tools accelerator, known in the trade as Act A. Um, look, this had to be designed on the fly. COVAX is part of it. It's not entirely successful. It's pretty much based on a market model. We think this needs a lot of thought to be redesigned as a standing platform for the future on a global public uh, goods uh, uh, model. We haven't elaborated a lot on that, but that's the direction we would like to uh, see it take. Uh, on WHO, just to uh, recap again, it, it needs more authority. It needs more independence. More independence would come from having uh, predictable and sustainable funding. And we've also recommended that in future, director generals and regional directors should each only serve a single term of office of seven years. I happen to hold that view for other uh, senior officers as, as well in the UN, in UN system. We think it's quite an important here. Uh, so um, we've recommended, uh, of course, changes around the surveillance system where WHO has authority to get in on site fast. Uh, that should be an explicit power that it has, must be able to publish rapidly and so on. I've been over some of these, these uh, criteria. Ultimately, of course, preparedness will depend a lot on national governments setting up the right structures and developing the needed uh, capacities and investing in vital assets like universal health coverage and other system resilience and social protection. And there's uh, quite a bit, I think, that governments can take out of the, the work that we've done on, on what is uh, best practice. So uh, in, a, in a rather lengthy nutshell, uh, that's uh, the, the the scope of, of the report, one we hope won't lie buried in the vaults of, of governments and international organisations. Uh, it does require focus now at the most senior level of, of governments in the international system. Uh, we think uh, the General uh, Assembly of the UN is the most inclusive and representative body which should uh, take on the task of negotiating a political declaration on the reform path. Um, and if necessary, hold a, a special event uh, to endorse that. When I say negotiated, they may not necessarily accept all our ideas in negotiation, but let's get something out of this review and, and out of the others. And let me just conclude on, on the point that 
Uh, the WHO in the past has benefited enormously from political declarations uh, negotiated by the GA, uh, non-communicable diseases, universal health coverage uh, being among them, and uh, this is quite a well-established path for something of this importance. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much, um, Helen. Um, uh, before I turn things over to Alan for uh, a conversation, um, I'd like to remind those of you who are participating online that this is interactive. You can, of course, use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to type any questions that you may have, and after the conversation, we'll have a Q&A session. Um, but now I will turn things over to Alan Gingell. Alan, please take it away. Thanks very much. Uh... Ellen, for that uh, for that uh, wonderful um, exposition on on uh, on what uh, what the members of the uh, panel wanted to come out of it, I want to sort of test you first on the difference between the hopes that you expressed and uh, and your expectations for uh, for what will come out of the. Uh, uh, of the uh, panel report, I know you you know you can't be uh, be certain of anything, but as you move around, as you talk to members of the um, UNGA uh, this morning to other political leaders, um, what's your sense of the uh, of the willingness of uh, of people to to actually move on this uh, list of recommendations you've you've come to? I think uh, that the minimum case scenario will be that there will be movement, uh, perhaps to a more limited extent than we uh, have uh, proposed, but, but it could be better than that. I, I must say, by and large, the statements at the General Assembly were extremely encouraging. Um, on, on the idea of a, a senior oversight council, I mean, that's also being backed by uh, the G20 uh, panel. Uh, they have a slightly more complex structure, seeing the role for the one we propose, which would be General Assembly endorsed, but seeing a role for health and finance ministers uh, beneath that, which, which may well have a place. You know, that's, that's why we continue to talk across panels. Um, the WHO Director General seeing the way this was drifting uh, has proposed that the head of state and government level council should come out of the WHO structure itself. So WHO elects an executive board. He says, why don't we then above that have a layer of health and finance ministers or whatever meeting and above that uh, leaders. I suppose, I suppose our point would be, we still think it, it's bigger than, than WHO uh, and, and the health sector. So if you ground it there, you may not get the, the comprehensiveness that's, that's required. But as I say, this is kind of the range of options that's emerging. So it's not that there'll be no major oversight council, there will be. It'll be, you know, are there, are there other layers to it? And does it come out of the, the broader mandate of the General Assembly or out of the World Health Assembly? On the convention, look, there's quite a lot of support for that. But then the next question is, well, how many powers would it give? So I think the debate will be more about what goes in the convention rather than whether or not there's a framework uh, convention. On financing, I think there will be recognition that there needs to be dedicated finance. The debate could, could be uh, whether the existing IFIs are asked to uh, provide windows for that or, or whether we have this, as we've recommended, global public goods model. Of, of financing it, but I think there will be, uh, we will end up with some dedicated financing one way or another. Uh, I think WHO will end up strengthened from this. The question will be how much? Um, and then I think perhaps one of the bigger debates will be around the standing platform uh, on the, the tools needed to fight a pandemic. You know, how do you create a viable global public goods model uh, for the development and allocation of, of, of vaccines, therapeutics, and so on. So, you know, I'm actually mildly optimistic. We're, we're going to get something out of this, whether it goes the whole way out, panel swung, or level somewhere in between, or is de minimis, who knows, but something will come of it. 
It's great. And, uh, and uh, you know, he hearing that from you is, uh, makes me more optimistic than I was um, uh, originally. Look, on, on WHO, I, I found what you said tonight, but also what you wrote in the, uh, in the, uh, in the report really, uh, really interesting. There was a huge amount of uh, criticism of the WHO here in Australia uh, at the uh, at the beginning, uh, some of the criticism uh, you sort of validated in what in what you uh, in what you you wrote. Um, others you other, others you didn't. You, you talked about um, the public health emergency of international concern declaration here in in Australia. The um, the the criticism was that WHO hadn't declared a pandemic, and I, I and um, until. Till later, a pandemic, I assume, being a sort of a, you know, more more technical uh, technical term. So the, the people seem to be waiting for something other than what you, you know, d describe as the highest level warning that uh, WHO can uh, can give. So um, were people not sort of jumping up and down enough at the at the at the time? What so uh, what went wrong? Well. When the word pandemic is used, we all go, you know, pandemic. <laughs> uh, the problem is that the word pandemic is not in the dictionary of the international health regulations. The highest level of alert is this long phrase, the public health emergency of international concern. And for, for those who've never heard it, when they hear people talking about the declaration of a fact, you think, what? Declaration of what? I mean, it has no impact, right? So, so language is a problem. I mean, personally, I'd call it pandemic um, or, or have some layer of alert above this fact, which is a pandemic. But you know, eventually Dr. Tedros used the term because he could see that what they were saying day after day had no cut through. And I have a, a very clear recollection of um, meeting with him uh, uh, privately and with others in probably around the 17th or 18th of February, and he said to us, I'm very worried, he said, there's a narrow window to avert a pandemic and it's closing fast. And we said, well, that's terrible. What can you do? And he said, well, I have a press conference every day. And eventually out of, I think, sort of just sheer frustration at not getting cut through, he used the P word, but it has no legal meaning. It brings no extra powers with it. So obviously that's something that needs to be considered. And if you could call a convention, a pandemic framework convention, maybe that will, will start to get some cut through. But the attitude we took was that WHO did not fail. The system failed WHO and member countries failed WHO by not heeding, heeding its guidance. Um, you know, there were just so many things that, that couldn't go right um, in the way it was required to, uh, to act. And as I say, we, we re remain puzzled as, as to why on that meeting of the 22nd, 23rd January, the uh, declaration wasn't recommended by the committee. And we think you know, really it needs to be clearer that regardless of what the emergency committee recommends, if, if WHO DG and his officials have a clear conviction that that's what's needed, they should be empowered to declare it, right? I mean, it's, I think, the emergency committee seems to have kind of morphed over into almost being we can't do it unless we say so. That's not right. If your top world global health officials say we've got a problem here, <laughs> shouldn't they be able to, 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 to call it out? Uh, another respect in which the IHR were not very helpful is on the issue of travel, because they're written uh, in a way that says there, there should not be any action which causes something like, quote, unnecessary disruption to travel and trade. Now, of course, we don't want, quote, unnecessary disruption. That can be taken too far. Uh, but with that kind of language ringing in his ears, when Dr. Tedros made the declaration, he used the term, it was not necessary to take special measures on travel. Now, all I can say is I'm very pleased that New Zealand acted, as I'm sure Australia did, and some others did in early February, to stop flights from China and then people coming from Iran and then to the point that we got to close borders. Where would we have been if we hadn't taken that action? So I think these regulations uh, that they're 
2005 uh, uh, draft of, as I recall, you know, at, at that time, we didn't have the, the global connectivity out of China that we see that we see today. And I, I don't, you know, I don't wish in, in any way to be casting an aspersion in saying that, but we're not in the connectivity environment we were in with SARS in 2003, when, for example, Australia, New Zealand, Paris, Amsterdam, wherever, we're not receiving very large numbers of Chinese tourists. So, you know, we just have to rethink uh, the IHR for the modern, highly uh, mobile uh, age that we lived in until the pandemic struck. Yeah. Um, I, I want to cheat if I, if I could and ask you a question which is not really related to the work of the panel uh, at all, but I, I wondered if you could reflect on how New Zealand and Australia, to the extent that you have an impression, have been affected uh, by the pandemic. We've been pretty lucky back here, uh, down here, obviously, because of our, uh, our geography uh, in part. But to a larger degree than I would have expected anyway, Australians seem to have adjusted to this new situation with enormous uh, enthusiasm and sort of, you know, hunk hunkering down in the, in the cave and, and ignoring the, uh, the, the, the rest of the world. Um, your, your entire political career really has been marked by your support for a just, uh, sustainable and peaceful society and you've indeed just set up a foundation I think to uh, to explore those uh, those issues does the pandemic make you more optimistic about those goals or, or less in other words could you talk from the uh, from the from the domestic out to the international rather than the the uh, the way around yes uh, obviously wouldn't want to speak for Australia but maybe we have all got a bit more you know, self-absorbed and focused behind our our large moats, mm. um, and you know, I mean, certainly in New Zealand, we've been protected to the extent that you know, looking at the TV, it's like looking at a, another world. Uh, you know, the epicenter of the pandemic currently is, is Indonesia, which is obviously a very close neighbour to uh, to Australia. Thailand's having terrible third or fourth or whatever whatever wave it is. And of course, is it fourth wave is fifth wave through Africa, which is causing chaos, but we're, we're kind of remote from it. And all I can say is, uh, apart from thanking our lucky stars, can we be as generous as we can be uh, to help others to overcome this? Because our lives are never going to be normal unless everyone's lives can assume some greater normality in the new normal that we will live in. Because let's face it, the best case scenario we're looking at is ending the pandemic phase, but the disease becoming endemic. Uh, and then if it becomes endemic in countries like ours, to the extent that we you know, get our booster or revaccination or protect ourselves by whatever means, but in a least developed country, they only ever got the first round of vaccines you know, two years late and never got the boosters. I mean, life can't be the same again. And for you know, adventurous people like Australians and New Zealanders who like traveling to the most far-flung corners on earth, you're not going to feel like doing that. You know, our world will have changed. Uh, so you know, if, if we put in that self-interest term, it, it might start to register that we have a common interest in, in stopping this because um, until it's become a cliche until everybody's safe from this. None of us are going to live particularly securely. And as long as it continues to rage, we will see these more and more challenging variants emerge. I mean, Delta has really thrown a span on the works. I think there was probably you know, a naive expectation when the vaccines emerged at, at the end of last year that, oh, well, we'll all get vaccinated and that'll be that. Well, hang on a minute. <laughs> you know, Delta is proving quite adept at breaking through the the vaccine uh, barrier, and while it may, the vaccines obviously uh, you know, mean there's a much lesser likelihood of hospitalisation. Um, who knows what it means about the vaccinated person who's caught it, their ability to transmit it. I mean, this disease is changing; it's morphing all the time. So, you know, we we just 
have to get out of the pandemic phase and then we have to start you know, trying to suppress, 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 control, control, get ahead of it uh, at a global level. And this is going to be extremely challenging. Uh, uh, Bryce said at the, uh, as Bryce said at the beginning, you, you uh, ran the United Nations uh, Development uh, uh, Program, you co-chaired uh, this inquiry um, as Prime Minister, uh, and since then you've seen multilateralism, uh, global multilateralism at close, as close quarters. Um, when you look at it, and not just the WHO and the issues that you raised there, but when you when you think about now UNESCO or the WTO or any of the major international organisations, they all seem to be in a pretty uh, distressing condition. Um, do, do you have, uh, have you sort of come to any views as a result of the work that you've been doing on how multilateralism can survive, prosper, change in the very different global um, order we're moving into now. You, or I mean, in the in the report, you, you talk about systemic, uh, yeah, yeah. the requirement for systemic uh, change. What what are your thoughts on that more broadly? Well, we, we say that the response to the pandemic was impeded by this being a low point in, in multilateralism, and by the you know, the toxic geopolitical tensions. Conversely. You know, it, if it were possible to get some agreement around a reform path in this area going forward, we could see that as a, a trust building measure, if you like, for greater cooperation in other areas. So if one could pick areas like this, uh, perhaps climate, uh, you know, look, biodiversity, I mean, could we, you know, while recognizing that there's some, some big and difficult peace and security issues, could we start to build trust on things where uh, the, the common interest is just so obvious that, that, that we're all in it together and we all suffer if, if the problems aren't uh, tackled. So, you know, we, we could see it as a moment of opportunity. You know, our greatest challenges also come opportunities to, to build something uh, anew. That, that would be my hope. I mean, with WTO, I do have uh, high hopes of the new leader. Uh, is a, obviously a different kind of leader of, of WTO from what they've had before. And I think they need a leader. They need more than a trade specialist. They, they need someone who's used to uh, brokering deals and, um, and, and convening people. And I think Ngozi has got off to a, a great start. So I'm optimistic about that. I mean, where the, where the worries, the big worries are, I think are very much in the peace and security uh, area. Uh, look at what's been happening in northern Ethiopia. Uh, look at what's been happening in Myanmar. Look at the polarization of the Security Council, and that, and that's just you know the, the big issues of the last um, uh, eight nine months or so. Uh, the council's never been able to act decisively on Yemen or Syria, or, you know, a, a long uh, sad list. Um, so yeah, I, I think. Um, one, one would just hope that there might be a political dynamic at some point, and twin track diplomacy is very important in that, and looking at ways to, to try to get back into some more measured discussion about what we need to do together. Thanks very, thanks very much. I'm going to hand back to Bryce now to open up the uh, uh, questions to others in our audience. Great, thank you, Alan, and thank you so much, Alan, for such a stimulating uh, discussion. Uh, indeed, a very big nutshell <laughs> uh, that you've uh, that you've uh, that you've that you've traversed. And um, again, a reminder to our online audience: you can um, just type your questions in the Q and A um, uh, facility, and we have some already. Um, now, if you are uh, part of our live audience, just put up your hand and Nancy will come around with uh, a microphone and um, if you could stand and state your uh, your name and any affiliation you might have that would be fantastic. So um, our first online question is an anonymous attendee. Um, uh, they have asked um, <clears throat> about um, the efficacy of a treaty. They've, they've asked if a treaty is adopted 
Are you concerned the ratification requirement means implementation will be even more patchy than state adherence to the IHR? In other words, are you, uh, be careful what you wish for. Are you asking for more bureaucracy here? Well, I hope not. As I said, the issue about the convention, I think, will probably not be whether there is one, but uh, what powers are in it. And I, I, I get the impression from WHO that in a way they're almost concerned about having compliance powers in the treaty. They, they see themselves as more like firemen than policemen, the phrase that's been used to, to, to me. But um, I think at, at the very least, a new legal instrument should spell out much more clearly the obligations of, of member states with, with respect to uh, reporting um, and to the powers that WHO has. Um, you know, in, in the end, I suppose people who, who want to break treaties um, and responsibilities that signed up to uh, break them, but let, let's start on the basis that we need to negotiate something that everyone agrees would be helpful in stopping a future uh, event of this kind. So I think we have to give it our best shot and the more teeth it's got, uh, the happier I'll be, but uh, you know, yeah, let's see where it goes. Uh, all right, we have another question again from an anonymous attendee. Um, and they're asking about um, the role of the Security Council in health diplomacy. Uh, why not turn to the Security Health uh, Council for health security diplomacy? Why will a new body that's less powerful than the UN Security Council, uh, the Global Health Threats Council, produce a different income? Now, I'd remind anybody else who has a question to please enter theirs into the Q&A. Well, I mean, at, at one point in our discussions, there was a discussion as to whether there should be, you know, a sort of, I don't know, a special committee of the Security Council, but I wouldn't have that as my first preference because I find there's quite an allergic response to the use of the word uh, security. Uh, you'll start seeing people opine about the securitization of health and uh, this being the, the wrong approach. That's why we ended up calling our proposed body a Global Health uh, Threats Council, didn't use the word security. Um, the Security Council, of course, uh, it, it, its resolutions have the, uh, the power of international law. The member states are, are bound to uphold them. We, we haven't suggested that this body this be, be that kind of body. Uh, but rather on oversight, calling to account, keeping political momentum around, you know, mobilizing resources and support for pandemic preparedness and, and response, calling out, holding accountable where necessary. So I don't think those kind of functions at this time would sit well in the kind of space that the Security Council's uh, in. Uh, I, think, I think we might achieve more with the, the kind of format that we're, we're thinking about. Okay, great. Is there a um, question from the floor? Uh, could you please put your hand up if you have a question? Thank you. Uh, Penny Wensley, uh, former ambassador to the UN in New York and Geneva and uh, a fellow of this institute. Uh, Helen, just following up on that um, last comment, uh, it seems to me listening to you that uh, there is a sense of urgency about uh, trying to galvanize the international community to make some decisions. But we all know that you can get bogged down in things like negotiating a convention and so on. And even if you don't take something to um, debate uh, to make decisions in the Security Council, there are other avenues. For example, um, a special session of the Security Council. I, I know you've taken it to the General Assembly, but that's also pretty unwieldy. And uh, there have been highly effective special sessions held of the Security Council to deal with very particular issues. Uh, we did it with HIV and AIDS. 
uh, and we did it with women, peace and security. And that really acted as an accelerant uh, and an attention grabbing device that uh, helped to galvanize action by the international community. So I just, uh, I wouldn't discount the possibility of looking at involving the Security Council, but in a different way. Yes, uh, I mean, I, I agree. Um, uh, an open session or whatever the current terminology is of the Security Council on this would be a good idea. Um, I mean, clearly last year, uh, it, it was impossible to get the Security Council to act on COVID-19 in the way that it had, for example, acted on um, Ebola uh, only five, but six years before. In 2014, the Security Council declared Ebola to be a threat to peace and security and urged all member states to do whatever they could to avert that threat. Now, nothing like that was able to be negotiated uh, last year. And uh, after a lot of haggling, uh, the only resolution the Security Council passed was a, a pretty mild one, which uh, about two months late backed the Secretary General's call for a cessation of hostilities and all conflict around the world so that everyone could focus on fighting COVID. Uh, I mean, it had one or two other you know, bits and pieces thrown in, but it, it wasn't a strong resolution. Now, you know, whether there's any more appetite now uh, for, uh, for negotiating something of the kind I've suggested, I don't know, because the, you know, the, the geopolitics among major powers are still not, not great. So then come to the idea of a special session of the General Assembly, which is exactly what our report called for. Uh, we felt that if the uh, if the General Assembly now meeting with the permanent representatives and missions uh, could agree to start a process towards a political declaration and a special session, then the negotiations could start with co-facilitators, wide consultation, and have something to serve up to what would probably be an online head of state and head of, head of government level summit. That's what we'd like to see. Uh, it could be a high level event. It could be in the end, the Secretary General deciding to have a, a global health security summit, which is not, not impossible either. Uh, but one way or another, we would like to see the GA uh, negotiate on, on a reform path, which is not to say that we're asking the General Assembly to do everything. A lot of things do properly belong with the World Health Assembly, but there are issues that are broader, we think, than the World Health Assembly and need uh, the strong backing of the political declaration. Very good. Now we've got uh, two uh, related questions, and it's related to your, uh, your your comment about, I guess, geopolitical uh, concerns. Uh, might be a bit controversial. Uh, they're asking about China. Our um, uh, our uh, national vice president, uh, national vice president of the AIIA. Zara Kempton um, is asking whether China is showing any interest in being involved in the high level body your committee has proposed to support the World Health Organization. And our anonymous attendee again uh, has asked, uh, what's your view on the continued debate about the inter international investigation into the lab leak theory, the SARS-CoV-2 lab leak theory? Um, and uh, that uh, contributor is referring to Dr. Tedros's comments that China needs to cooperate here with access to 2020 da data on infections in Wuhan. Um, mm -hmm. As we know, China has um, been reluctant or, or rather the lab has been reluctant to uh, produce uh, the, the, those data. Um, uh, what is your view on, on, on um, China's cooperation in international regimes? Well, on the, uh, the first question, um, China has not come out against our report. Uh, China has, uh, has made constructive comments about the report. It's studying it. You know, it's not ruling anything in or out. And I think that's not a, a bad position to be in. Um, interestingly, at the General Assembly uh, briefing in the, the and the statements we had from member states, 
the only member state that really queried, you know, why would the GA be involved is, is Russia. Now, Russia's taking quite a, it, it, it's taking a view that these are really matters for the World Health Assembly and the WHO. But our panel doesn't take that view because of the many consequences we see in a pandemic, which we think are just broader than what WHO health ministers and 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 civil servants can can deal with. Uh, but we're not seeing other states take as a firm position like that. We found today, and, and we will actually be able to access the statements and hopefully group the member state uh, statements and put them on our website so people can see. I, I thought people were very open-minded about how, how to move forward on that. And, and this, you know, by and large, in, includes China too. Um, now, on the, uh, the second question, um, as I, let me just um, bring it up again. Uh, as, as I said before, you know, thank, thank goodness uh, we, we aren't the, um, uh, the origin of the virus um, uh, committee. Uh, that was uh, uh, another hapless crowd, as it were. Um, but uh, cl clearly the report uh, satisfied no one much. Um, and the problem is we, we don't, there is no clear evidence of the, you know, the root of the virus from the bats to human beings. So there's no clear evidence uh, for the market theory. Um, we haven't got the clear evidence on a lab theory or any number of lab theories. So, you know, the jury's out and I suppose all one can say as a citizen of the world is that the, the more open everyone can be, uh, and the more we understand about how these viruses end up you know, causing us this kind of catastrophe, but that this has to be in the global public interest. Um, so the debate will go on. Will we ever know? Who knows? Um, is already more known by a range of powers than we see in the public arena? Who knows? Yeah. Open question. So, you know, I'm with Dr. Tedros and the, the file can't be closed. Okay, I can't quite see clearly the, uh, the, the the picture of the floor is quite small for me. So if there's somebody there with a question, oh, it looks like um, it's uh, David Nat King. Do you have a question? Um, tēnā kwe, Helen, and it's great to see you and to hear you. Um, one of the roles that you gave me as your former Minister of Health was to attend the World Health Assembly for six years in a row. And one thing I learned was how political that environment was. And I'm wondering whether you, how much politics will play a part in getting reform in the WHO? Um, what role will countries who have held up um, reform for a long time in the past, taking a look, say, at the Framework Convention on Tobacco Echo control is a good example. How how much will politics prevent the reforms that you believe are necessary? I think that if we lose this moment, when every government in the world is focused on COVID, then the politics would take over. That's why I think it's quite urgent to move while the subject is preoccupying every head of state and government of the world, and to elevate it to that to that level. That that. And if people take on board the clear findings from our panel that this catastrophe could have been averted, but we weren't prepared and we didn't respond well as a global community, then you know surely we don't want to repeat this experience of millions of lives lost, millions of people's health ruined forever, $22 trillion loss to the global economy over around a you know, five, six year period. And this is this is catastrophic. Uh, so can we act now? I think that that's the spirit we should approach this in. Because if it is just allowed to drift away and more countries get vaccinated and feel more secure and things go back to some kind of you know, semi-normality, the moment will be lost. So the moment is now. That's why it should be treated as a Chernobyl moment. You know, isn't it amazing that when you think about it that the in the dying days of the Cold War within five months you could get two new conventions on nuclear safety and here we are in the 21st century 
faced with a catastrophic pandemic, the like of which we haven't seen since 1918, and we fumble around, um, you know, saying what's the way forward. Our panel has provided a way forward. Other panels are adding you know, to the range of proposals. I think the time has come for serious negotiation and to try and seal some kind of deal this year while the issue is hot on the way ahead. A follow-up to that? I'm muted, apparently. No, we can continue. I'm, not, I'm no longer muted. Thank you. Uh, uh, no, I forgot what the <laughs> was it follow up, follow up was it? No, I know what it was. Um, the, uh, because of this urgency, which I, you know, no one listening to your uh, to your talk tonight or reading the report can uh, uh, can doubt. I just wondered whether whether you see ways in which um, uh, you know non-members of the the P5, other governments should be acting to galvanise the sort of um, focus uh, that you're that you're talking about. I mean, are there emerging coalitions of uh, of, uh, of powers which are doing that in the way that there are in the in the um, on uh, climate change and and so on as well? In other, not leaving it not leaving it to the uh, to the P5 and the great powers. Yes, I think there is there is a group at uh, that's been meeting at the UN, uh, I think called uh, uh, Friends of Global Health Security, and they were instrumental in getting our briefing. The President of the General Assembly took the view that he would hold a briefing and member states asked for it. So the, the Friends of Global Health Security, led by Korea, enthusiastically backed by Canada and others, asked for it. Uh, but actually, it wasn't only Korea and Canada who were making wonderful statements this morning. A wide range of countries. Uh, you know, South Africa, we've had tremendous support, you know, from Rwanda. We've had a head of state uh, and government round table. So there's, there's quite a lot of broad-based interest in this. And I think that what could be done now is if the friends of, of, of global health security could now you know, rally a broad coalition to say, look, you know, there's plenty of food for thought in what we've been presented with. Uh, why don't we, as a General Assembly, go down the path towards a special session? We would need, as you know, the permanent missions here in New York with backing from our capitals to start, you know, point co-facilitators, start uh, thought about what might go into this. That, that's, I think, where we would like to see the pressure come on, on now to get that process moving. Because if we can get it moving, we, we will, there can be a declaration. It might be weak, it might be strong, it might be somewhere in between. Whatever, it'll be better than what we've got at the moment. Uh, so that, that's where I think the voice of Australia and New Zealand, the Pacific, um, really everyone's voice counts in getting that momentum for, for this to happen. Ideally a special session and ideally uh, a negotiated declaration. Let, let's repeat again, and I think Penny Wensley reinforced the point, there's a history of doing this in health. We've had we have special sessions every three or four years on on HIV AIDS. We had the major special session of head of state and government level on non-communicable diseases at the time I was at the UN. A couple of years ago there was one on universal health coverage, which got a very good outcome at head of state and government level. Now this is as important as those issues. That's the spirit in which we should approach it. So any voice from Australian government and other friends to get in behind that process would be incredibly helpful. Very good. Now we have um, a question from the the internet that um, I think you were actually particularly well placed to answer. Um, <clears throat> uh, and I mean, you've talked about um, gender inequality in terms of how um, how the pandemic has affected women, but there's another uh, uh, type of gender equality, I guess. And this questioner asks, what do you think of the research showing that women leaders so far, and particularly in the early stages of the pandemic, um, that their response to the COVID pandemic has been more effective and more equitable? Is there something about women's leadership? Of course, we can um, talk about uh, Jacinda Ardern, um, but also uh, the leadership of Tsai Ing-wen in Taiwan was particularly effective um, in the early stages of the pandemic. Um, leaders in Denmark um, uh, and in Finland as well, Sanamarin, um, 
uh, have been notably successful in handling the pandemic. Is there something about um, gender and leadership that uh, that, uh, that that makes uh, female leaders more effective at managing uh, crises like these? I think I think there's a style of leadership um, which is associated with women, but which if also uh, practiced or adopted by men is quite successful. And, and that has been an effective style in fighting the, the pandemic. Um, I think uh, if you look at the, the, the women leaders have been successful, and, and a lot of them have been, and, and let's include Angela Merkel, who's really done an incredible job, uh, Erna Solberg in Norway, plus the, the women PMs, Norway, Finland, Iceland, the Taiwanese president, um, you know, Mia Motley in Barbados, I mean, there's been quite a range. Uh, they've been empathetic. They've been seen to be putting uh, health front and centre. Uh, you're taking the view that, you know, if you say economy first, that's the wrong way around. You can't have a strong economy if your people aren't, aren't healthy and, and, and secure. Uh, I think yeah, also they've listened to advice. There's been less ego. You haven't seen populist females, leaders striding the stage, denying science. Uh, you've seen you know, the women listening to the evidence and assessments they're presented with and, and you know, in a more collegial fashion, I guess, uh, using, using their judgment uh, on that. We've also seen some pretty effective communication from women. Jacinda Ardern is a superb communicator, but you know, looking at a, a number of the others, uh, also very good communicators and, and being upfront with their public. As I say, the, this, the, the good responses have by no means been confined to countries with women leaders. There, there, you know, there are a, a valid responses from, from countries with male leaders of, as well, of course. Um, but uh, the more that leaders have been prepared to be consultative, empathetic, uh, putting health and what people's welfare and well-being to the fore and being transparent, I think the better the responses have gone. Okay, very good. Now we do have another question from uh, online. I'll just uh, I'll just ask the live audience if there's anybody there. If you could put your hand up, uh, ah, there's one. Okay, thanks, Nancy. Um, Margaret Sainsbury, just a member of AIIA. Just one question about the M word, money. Uh, so many good ideas found are through not inadequate funding, and it seems that the moment we're in globally um, has a lot of calls on that finance. Countries are really suffering from the pandemic and there's apocalyptic things going on in the climate change area. I just wonder how we're going to carve out the finance needed to support a big flow of, of um, resources from the first world to the third world. Mm. Yes, it, you know, it, it's not that it's going to cost a lot of money. I mean, it's a case of billions saving trillions um, for pandemic preparedness and response. And the, you know, the general view is that for about 10 billion a year, you could do an enormous amount to, to support uh, low and low, low middle income countries to, to get their, their, their systems and procedures uh, in place, overhauled, ready, you know, it's not mega bucks. Uh, so if it was financed on a global public goods basis, like, like we've suggested, and maybe that would need to have a basis in, a, in the convention, uh, it wouldn't be a heavy uh, levy uh, on, on countries. But then a facility needs the capacity to leverage, as we set up for that 100 billion, pretty fast if a pandemic gets on the loose. Uh, so that the response plans can be put into action, the supplies uh, procured and so on. So compared to the cost of fighting the climate crisis, this is really the petty cash. <laughs> but if, if we're not prepared to you know, leverage and raise the, the petty cash, we're, we're going to be up for trillions again and again, unfortunately. So it, it just has to become a priority. I often think you know, preparedness is like the, the dog that didn't bark. It hasn't barked for so long that we really stopped investing in it. And uh, now it's barked, we, we know where we went wrong. So we shouldn't make the same mistake again. 
I should say, having and knowing that Annette is in the in the room, Annette probably remembers more about SARS because she was the Minister of Health. But what I do remember, Annette, is that under your leadership, when we reviewed the experience with SARS, whatever it was, we decided we needed a purpose-ready legislation. And uh, we took the, I think it was the Epidemic Preparedness or Response Act uh, through Parliament in, in 2006. Uh, and that was uh, you know, a good piece of legislation, which was the foundation for the pre present government to be able to act from. So that was a learning uh, from that SARS experience, as I say, whatever it was. And, and we really would recommend as a panel that every government does a lessons learned exercise now, and that WHO sets up clear, not vague, clear targets about what needs to be done uh, to be ready. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we could go on all night, but unfortunately, uh, you know, people people do have to switch off and eat dinner, I guess. So um, I'm going to turn things over to uh, to Ellen for a formal um, uh, word of thanks. Uh, Helen, thank you, thank you so much for for this evening. In an earlier life, I used to uh, uh, run a think tank, and I would tell my colleagues there that if they wanted to have an impact on public policy, they need to write with two questions in mind. What is the problem? What should be done? And uh, the uh, your, your panel did that uh, magnificently well, uh, I, I, I think. And the agenda that you set uh, then is one that, uh, that the world is going to have to come to terms, terms with uh, if we are, you know, as you said, not to face all this again. You've been on the go, as you told us, since early, early, uh, early this morning, um, uh, you know, zo zo zooming with, uh, with uh, the UN and now Australia. Can't thank you enough for giving your time to us uh, like this, but I can assure you on this side that it's uh, richly appreciated. Uh, I ask everyone to join me in. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. <laughs> okay, that's uh, that's a wrap, everybody. Uh, please uh, do check out um, our website, internationalaffairs.org.au, for further events. Um, I can just tell you, although it's not on, up on the website yet, uh, in uh, August, I think it's the 12th of August, we will be having a discussion on um, uh, on a new publication that we're putting out by Michael Bliss uh, with uh, a, uh, an afterword by Gary Quinlan uh, on the, um, the uh, role of Australia in the United Nations Security Council. So that will be one to watch. Um, I'd like to thank uh, again, Helen and um, Alan for leading this, the discussion. It's been such uh, a great event. Um, I'd also like to thank Nancy uh, Schneider, who's been uh, handing out the microphone, um, Min uh, Fong Fu, who has been um, recording the audience, and, uh, and Phoebe Humphreys, who is our, our communications assistant. Thank you all. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Alan. Good night, all. Good night.